Okay, so uh, today we're doing day four of Eddie Karen level one. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be going over chapters, uh, chapter seven, which is the final chapter for level one on our book. We've already gone through chapter one through six in lessons one in part one, two, and three of these videos. And uh, this uh, chapter, okay, it's going to be for information purposes and it won't be um, part of the test, okay. Uh, let me share my screen so you can have a better idea. Okay, so we're going to be doing lux, uh, flux leakage uh, sensing elements, okay, and we know that flux leakage, okay, um, it's its own discipline, NDT discipline in itself, okay, and this is more for inf information purposes, okay. Um, it applies to eddy current because part of the theory of eddy current, okay, it's applicable to flux leakage, right? Just like magnetic particle is, actually flux leakage. It's more of a of of, uh, of all my particle, except in the sense that we tend to well, pick up the indication in a different manner. Okay, but uh, it's more it's more related to a mag to a magnetic particle than it is to eddy current. Even though a lot of the terms, you know. You should be familiar with. Okay, so we're gonna go over lesson seven today. It's not there's not much to it. Okay, it's just about the sensing elements for this type of inspection, and then we're gonna go over a review. Okay, for the final exam for a general. Okay, so flux leakage sensing elements lesson seven. So inductive coil sensors. Okay. So ferrites are usually used to pick up inductive coil sensors because they do not only provide support for the wire turns, but they also concentrate the flux density through the coil windings by a value equal to, uh, to the effective permeability of the ferrite. For small pieces of ferrite, as illustrated in the following images, image, where the dimensional ratio is small, the effective permeability of the ferrite may vary from the low tens Two thousands, okay, and we know that permeability is that is the ease with which material can be magnetized, okay. And so here you have a ferrite, okay, and uh, right, this would be your ferrite, okay, and you have your coil windings around it, okay, and uh, this is how the inductive coils uh, sensors, right. Uh, are they have this ferrite inside and actually in eddy current testing okay a lot of the probes you're going to be using have a ferrite also we have that coil wound right around it okay and this ferrite right concentrates the flux density through the coil windings by a value equal to the effective permeability of the ferrite, okay? So it concentrates that flux density. So that's why we tend to like that, to use that. That's why these sensors have that ferrite, right? And uh, a lot of uh, magnetic particle, a lot of um, eddy current uh, probes, okay, have this ferrite, okay? Ferrites may vary, may have very low electrical conductivities, minimizing detrimental eddy current effect effects on them. An inductive coil application, it is important to know. In inductive coil applications, it is important to note the following. A flux density must be changing through the coil in order to produce a signal. Okay. Pickup coils should be used to generate voltages and not currents. Okay. So that was with the inductive type uh, coil sensor. Now this is another sensor which is the Hall effect probe or the Hall effect sensor. Okay, uh, Hall elements are crystals of semiconductive material. When the current is passed through them, while it's placed in a magnet in the magnetic field, a voltage develops across the two faces of the crystal. The voltage is proportional to the strength 
of the magnetic field. T typical sizes are as small as 30 thousandths of an, of an inch in length by 15 thousandths of an inch in width, right? With a thickness of about 20 thousandths of an inch. Okay, and this, I'm reading those values here. Okay, or if you want to read them in centimeters, you could go with this. All right, so the following picture will show us some a couple configurations of some typical Hall sensor probes, right, and their specifications. Okay, so here you have the different type of probes, right, that would be used. Okay, these are all Hall effect sensors, right, and they're different, they're different dimensions, right, according to your specification, and your needs. Okay, so here's the here's the specs for this probes. So then we also have the, the flux gate magnetometer. Okay. A flux gate magnetometer is also referred to as a ferret probe or foster probe. It measures magnetic fields by utilizing a nonlinear magnetic characteristic of the ferromagnetic core materials as its sensing element. A drive coil and sense coil are wound onto an easily saturated core. The core characteristics and drive current are such that the magnetization changes induced by the, leak, by the leakage field affect the filter harmonic output of the sense coil. Okay. Then we also have the magnetodiode. Okay. And this is a solid state device whose resistance changes with the intensity of the magnetic field. Okay. So other methods of uh, the detection of magnetic fleet, uh, magnetic uh, leakage field, right, is the magnetic tape system. For the system, for the testing of flat uh, plates and billets, it's possible to scan the surface with a white strip of magnetic recording tape. These continuity signals are taken from the tape by an array of tape recorder heads. Magnetic particles are finely grounded, are finely ground hypermobility magnetic material. Sometimes dyed for visible contrast with the test surface, right? And we know this from magnetic particle. Ideal test conditions occur when the fine spray of particles is intercepted by a magnetic flux leakage field, and some of them are attracted to the field, right? And uh, that's pretty much a magnetic particle. Right, where we have our, our particles being attracted to that leakage, right? And so magnetic resonance sensors, right? Nuclear magnetic resonance mag magnetometers are based on the fact that the characteristic atomic frequency also depends on the strength of the magnetic field. In operation, when an atomic nucleus is placed in the constant magnetic field and is subject to a high-frequency alternating magnetic field, Resonance absorption of energy from the alternating current field takes place. Okay, so lesson seven review. Right? Other names for the flux gate magnetometer is or are eddy current coil. No. Foster probe. Yes. Ferro probe. Yes. Okay. So that that's this just that you know a couple of slides on on those sensors. Like I said, they're not going to be you're not going to have them in your test. But uh, but it's always good information to know how uh, magnetic flux leakage works. You know, and just kind of be familiar with these names. So if you ever come across, uh, you know, a company that does this type of inspection and, you know, or if you ever come across an, an inspection uh, that cannot be done by other methods, at least you, you know what magnetic field leakage can do and at least what, you know, what some of the uh, limitations are, like it's only good for paramagnetic materials, you know, and stuff like this. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the review now. And, uh, and this review will be more for the final exam, okay?
And so when we calibrate an equipment, okay, what we're trying to do is we're trying to set up our equipment with a piece of material that is has the similar dimensions and material characteristics as the one we're going to inspect, right? And we call this the reference standard. And we're trying to calibrate our, our material, our, our, our equipment with this piece of metal that has known uh, defects, right? And there's known defects in the in the shape of notches, grooves, uh, saturated holes, right? We call this artificial defect, or this defects, right, that we're going to simulate as a defect, right? We call them artificial defects, okay? So defects that we use to calibrate, that, that are on our reference or calibrating standards, okay, are called artificial defects, okay? And we use these reference standards, right, to set up our equipment so that because we have a known depth or a known size of our damage, right, we can calibrate our equipment to certain sensitivities depending on the size of our, of, our, of our damage. And so in turn, if you're doing your inspection, okay, if you were to find a problem, you could go ahead and, and uh, compare it to the signals you're getting from your reference uh, standard. And, and in this turn, you would be able to know, depending on the amplitude you're getting, how big of an, of an indication that would be, okay? Now, we also talked about when we have a probe, okay? So we have this probe and we have this piece of material, right? And when the probe is touching the material, right? What's having contact, well, that's, that's when you have no liftoff. But whenever you get that probe, okay? Of the material, okay, then you would call that liftoff. And what liftoff is is the separation between the head of your of your coil to the surface of your of your of your of your part of your testing of your test part. Okay, in this case being my hand. Okay. Now, if you were using an encircling coil, okay, for example, you have your coil, your encircling coil. This one that may look uh, similar, something similar to the wire, right? Around the pen being your part, okay. Depending how much your your coil, okay, or your your part is filling your coil, we call that the fill factor, right? And it's that ratio of di of uh, diameters between the part and your coil, okay. So the best, um, the best fill factor you want is the one closest to one, which is a hundred percent, okay. So if you were if you were given uh, a fill factor, okay, of let's say twenty percent and uh, fifty percent or a hundred percent, let's say a hundred and ten percent, okay, or even a hundred percent and ninety percent, the one you would go Four, right? It would be ninety percent. You can never feel something a hundred percent. Okay, I mean, if it's a hundred percent, it'll be the same size, and if it's if it's more than a hundred, it'll be because it, it, you're feeling more than than we possibly feel. Okay, so you always want your fill factor of your coil to be as close to one as possible. Right? If you, if I have a fill factor that is something similar, let's say something like this, right? Well, your fill factor, you, you may start having problems, right, with uh, some noise, which, and we know that noise, right, is that is the are is you know it's uh, indications from those uh, things that we're not interested in, such as like you know, for example, uh, fill factor, you know, that could be one one uh, noise. We're getting erroneous signals through that. If you're having a pencil probe, you know, a surface probe, a panking, or a flat probe, right, and you're scanning on, on a rough surface, right, that roughness could give you an indication or some drift on your flying dot on your screen, and we call that noise. And we know that the signal to noise ratio that we would like to have in our in our part is three to one, right? Three times the, and we want our indication to be three times bigger than 
the size of a, of an indication of noise, okay, which is an uh, which we're not really interested in, okay. Now we talked uh, uh, we talked about uh, absolute and, and differential coil arrangements, okay. And the one thing that we want to keep in mind is that uh, absolute, okay, coil arrangements, uh, they we can have them in a, in a probe type, okay, we can have them. Um, and in circling coils, we can have them in bobbin and coils, okay? This type of arrangements. Differential coil arrangements, right? We could have them. Differential, remember that we have self-comparison, and we also have uh, <clears throat> external comparison, okay? Something, let's see, that we want to remember here is that uh, eddy current, it's only applicable to materials that are conductors of electricity, okay? So eddy current can only be done on materials that are conductors such as aluminum, titanium, steel, um, you know, magnesium, and so forth, right? Copper. However, when you come and you start doing... Uh, when you start doing eddy current on materials such as that are not conductive, such as wood, okay, concrete, you no know, rubber, then you're not going to get any any anywhere with that type of inspection, just because eddy current is only applicable to electric materials that are conductors of electricity, right? And those are not. So that's one of the limitations we have. Okay. Now, if it's ferrous or it's not ferrous, it's not a problem. However, if the material is ferrous, right, then we may have to, to saturate the material, okay, to with a DC with with DC current, okay, in order to to uh, to kind of relieve or to kind of not have the permeability of of the material affect our readings, okay. So anytime. Depending on what, if you're having trouble doing a ferrous material such as steel, okay, you may have to saturate it with DC current, meaning magnetize the part so that the permeability of the part doesn't interfere with your testing, okay. Something that we talked about also was uh, about frequencies, right? We talked about frequency. Uh, we talked a little bit about conductivity and penetration, okay. When we talked about penetration and conductivity. We had we had mentioned that penetration and con and and uh, frequency, okay, they're inversely uh, related to each other. Meaning, as frequency goes up, right, the penetration goes down. Okay, so if you're trying to find defects in the very surface of your material, well, you might want to use a high frequency because you don't need a lot of penetration. Right? You don't need to penetrate the material. Your defects are going to be all the way in the, on the surface, right? However, when you when you need, when you need to start finding defects that are that are you know subsurface or below the surface, you might want to if you need more penetration than your frequency, you need to bring your penetration down, right? Because they're always uh, inverse to each other. Right? So for subsurface defects, right? If you need more penetration, you got to lower your frequency and the same thing goes for if you if you're trying to do only surface defects, so you don't need a lot of penetration, right? So you need low penetration, so that means that you gotta use a high frequency. Okay. Mm, on conductivity, we talked that we could uh, the conductivity. There's three factors that affect the the impedance in our coil. Okay, and and those are conductivity, permeability. And the dimensions of our part, okay, and so because the conductivity is one of those factors that affect the, the impedance in our coil, if we have different materials, okay, we can we can differentiate between one and one another using eddy current techniques, okay. And if you if you give me a second, I'll try to find a video I have here in which I have. In which I can show you how how this can be done. Okay. Let 
Let's see here. Okay, so I have a I have a video here that can show you okay how eddy current technique how we can use eddy current to differentiate between different materials different alloys right if if they have a unique conductivity to each other so for example right we have a set of materials here steel we have aluminum we have all this three are aluminum but they have different conductivities right we have titanium and we have two pieces of copper one being a hundred percent and IACS, right, it's international, it stands for International Anneal Copper Standard. And that's what we use to, uh, that's the designation for, uh, to inspect, to, for, uh, that's a unit of measurement for conductivity, okay. And so, whenever we inspect the material, we said that the material has X amount of number of uh, percent of IACS. 100% is 100% copper, right? So we are comparing other materials to copper. So we have a probe, okay, that we can actually calibrate to give us these exact numbers, 100 or 102 or, or I'm sorry, not 102, 12.2 or 32 or even 102, you know. That could give you that reading of percent IS. Yeah, so you calibrate your equipment, right? And uh, usually it's not this, well, this machine can't work for that, but you need a special probe. And so you have, you calibrate your equipment to tell the machine, okay, let's say uh, my minimum reading is going to be 18.07% ICS, and you put your probe on here. And then you tell the machine to take a reading here, and you tell the machine, now that reading is going to be 59.21. So the machine will do, will do its, its, uh, its, its math problems, okay, or it'll calibrate giving you this, by you giving them that, those set values, okay, and it'll know the conductivity of all the material. However, when we don't have that, but we only have an eddy current probe, okay, a surface probe, we can we can move, we can calibrate our equipment, okay, to give you the indication of different materials depending on on the movement. You see, so you could see how, okay, titanium would be here, and Anytime you have materials from the from the flying dot dependent, well obviously, right, after you calibrate your equipment, then you have to calibrate it correctly, and this will go over in, in um, level two. But from your flying dot, right, once you go, we'll talk about, I mean, that's a level two class when we start talking about the conductivity lockers. But ferrous materials will tend to go up in this direction, whereas non-ferrous materials will tend to go down. So, if we were to do this over again, right, the only material that's ferrous, okay, copper is not ferrous or ferromagnetic, aluminum, aluminum is not ferromagnetic, and titanium is not ferromagnetic, but steel is ferromagnetic. So, if we were to replay this video, we would see that this line matches to the steel, okay? So, let's see. So, when we touch the steel, that's when we should go up. You see? And these lines will tend to go down, further down, as you start increasing in conductivity. Okay? So when we have our machine set up like this, we can touch a piece of metal, and depending on where that flying dot lands, okay, we can compare it to our known standards. Okay? So for example, Right? If we have, if we touch a piece of metal and it goes exactly in this direction, we would say that that, you know, it's very likely that that material would be steel. If we have a material that comes right down along this line, you know, uh, we would say that that's a material that has a conductivity, if it's, you know, very, very close to the one that titanium has, okay? And if we have different aluminums, as it's, as it's in, in this case, right, we have an aluminum look of 18, 29, 59, and 32. And they're all aluminums. They're all the same material. But we can still differentiate 
right, between one and the other, right. So we can, these are all my four aluminum, right. So we can, depend on the frequency, and obviously, like I said, the further down you go, the higher the frequency. So I would think that this bottom line would be due to the 59%, okay. Then the highest, the second one up would be the 32, and then 29 would be this one, and then 18, right. Because as you go up, conductivity goes down. As you come down, conductivity, the conductivity value goes up. So we can use uh, eddy current to sort different uh, alloys, okay, and sort different mets, different materials, okay, and that's another application of eddy current of how we can do it, okay. <clears throat> we had mentioned also that. Uh, Eddy current, okay, the eddy currents in our part, are they traveled in a circular loops, okay, and they never cross each other, okay, they're always in loops, okay, and when we magnetize a part, okay, we say that the flux density, right, is measured in Gauss, G-A-U-S-S, -S, right, and G-U-A-S-S, -S, which is Gauss, equals, right, one Gauss is one line of flux or one line of, uh, of flux, right, in one square centimeter. And so we can use eddy current for different purposes, right, we can use it to, uh, to uh, sort different materials, right, we can sort materials out using the conductivity, uh, by conductivities, right, with our Eddy current equipment. We can measure the thickness of very thin material, right? We can measure the the clad or the coating, okay, of a material due to that liftoff effect, right? Because the liftoff, right, will separate your probe. The liftoff is a separation between your your the probe the face of your coil and your part, right? And so if you had paint or you had any type of coating on that, whether it be, uh, uh, a, con whether it be a conductive coating or not, such as a flat, for example, okay, for a conductive uh, coating, or a non-conductive, such as paint, okay? That separation between the probe and the part, right, you can actually set up your equipment to measure that as well, right? So there's different things that we can that we can do. Uh, there's different things we can do with eddy current. Okay. Uh, we know that any time you increase or you you bump up your gain on your equipment, okay, you tend to increase. Is like, uh, if let's say if you have your radio station on your on your car is not tuned right, right, and then you hear some static, right. If you increase the volume. Or in the case of, the, of, of, of our equipment, if you increase the gain, what you're doing is you're increasing the, the, the signal of your wanted signals, right? The amplitude, you're, you're increasing the amplitude of your wanted signals, but you're also increasing the, the, the amplitude of those signals that are noise, okay? So you have to be very careful that, you know, if, if you don't have the right uh, uh, signal to noise ratio by increasing the gain you're not helping the, 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 the signal to noise ratio okay maybe what you want to do is maybe you want to get a better uh, for example you you want to you want to smooth out your surface okay or maybe you want to have you want to get a better a better um, A better uh, fill factor, okay, if you're using an encircling coil or an inside diameter coil, which is a bowling coil, okay. And we know that also in eddy current, right, and in, in ultrasound, what generates that ultrasonic wave is that piezoelectric material that we have in our crystal, in our in our material, in our transducer, I'm sorry, called the crystal, 
in eddy current, what generates the eddy current, okay, is going to be that alternating magnetic field in our coil. That's the one that's going to induce the eddy current on our part, okay? We know that when we have a rod, okay, there's a one thing called the center effect, okay, and that's your eddy currents are going to be mostly dense at the area where they're having uh, contact with the coil, for example. This is your surface, right? And uh, this is your coil. Okay? If you're scanning with a pencil probe, the area where, it's, where your coil is touching your part, right, that's the surface that's going to have the most dense eddy currents. So, for example, if I put my, my probe on top of this, even if it's a low frequency, right, uh, my eddy currents are going to be mostly dense at the surface, and they're going to start fading as they start penetrating through the material. Okay. Same thing goes with uh, with uh, encircling coils and internal diameter coils. So, if we were to have a coil here, right, so my cable is my coil and uh, my pen is my part, the area that's going to have the most dense eddy currents is going to be the outer surface of my part. Okay? If I was having an internal coil, okay, meaning that my part is here and my coil was going inside, okay, kind of picture, right? it's kind of hard, but, right, then the, the most density of, of eddy currents is going to be on the inner diameter of my tube, let's say if we're checking a tube, right, because that's, that's, that's the one that's making contact with my, with my coil, right. But when we have a solid piece, right, and we're using an encircling coil, depending on the size of our, of our part, we can, we can get what we call the center effect. And what the center effect is, when you start penetrating, right, it can get to the point that the center doesn't get any penetration. And so the center could have problems and you might not even see them, okay, in your indication. So and when when we when we check in rods, right, that's one of the biggest uh, problems that we have or, or you know, or those are gonna be the hardest indications we're gonna be we're gonna be looking for, right? The ones right in that center of that piece. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else? We talked about uh, white coils, right? When we use encircling coils, right? Uh, when we use or or bobbing coils, internal coils, we we have large, right? A wide coil, right? Meaning a coil that would resemble something like this. No. So let's say a coil that would be this wide in comparison to a coil that might be, you know, maybe this wide, okay? And so this tiny coil, or this thin coil, this not very wide coil, would be used to find small defects, right? Small, small cracks, right? Uh, small changes in uh, diameter or conductivity, right? But when we use big white coils, we're actually looking, they're going to be most sensitive, right? Not for very small defects, but they're going to be most sensitive to gradual changes in dimension or gradual changes in conductivity, let's say, or permeability, okay? And so, Another thing that we want to know is that when we use an encircling coil, right, because we're inspecting all 360 degrees around the part at the same time, if we have an indication, we won't know the exact clock location, okay? So if your part is like this, right, and you have circular coils around the part, right, you would know if your indication is a 12, a 6, right, and so forth. So then you would have to come and get a surface probe, right, being that you already know where that coil is, now with the surface probe, you scan your part 
on the area where that coil is around 360 degrees to find to pinpoint your defect. Okay. We know that the okay impedance in our coil, right? Impedance is that total opposition of uh, current flow in the circuit, right? And so when we have an increase in impedance, right, in our in our coil, right, or in our system, right, we're actually going to have a decrease in the eddy current flow in our coil. Okay, so the current flow in our coil is going to be inverse to the relation of the impedance in our coil. Okay, so the more impedance you have in that coil, the less current flow you're going to have. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we need to know. Mm -hmm. So we know that field factor is for encircling coils and for bobbing coils, which are internal coils. But surface, uh, right, uh, field factor is for. Uh, Pencil probes or surface coils. Something you might want to know is the symbol of conductivity, of impedance, okay, of resistance, of of uh, current, okay, and those are the following. I'll show you now. And for current, okay, which is, okay, the symbol is I. For voltage, or EMF, which is right, electromagnetic force, is V, right, the voltage. Or, right, actually, more than V, it's going to be E. Okay. For resistance, it's going to be R. And the unit of measurement of current right, is going to be the amp, or the amp thread, the amp here. Right. The unit of measurement of voltage or EMF right, is going to be the volt. The unit of measurement of resistance is going to be the ohm. So you might want to know this. Conductivity, okay. It's expressed where the symbol of conductivity is this, okay. And it's measured in percent IACS. And we know that. IACS is the International Annealed Copper Standard. Okay, the permit the for permeability right. The symbol is going to be this U with a long uh, little line here. Okay, that's going to be the symbol for permeability. Okay. For inductive reactants, the symbol right is XL. For impedance, right, an inductive reactants is measured in ohms. This is the the symbol for ohms. Okay. For impedance, right, the symbol of impedance is this letter Z. 
Okay, you can have it like that or with the little. Right, that's fine. Right. And so you 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 wanna you wanna know this, okay? And you might wanna go ahead and and read through the chapters that. You just might want to go ahead and so this this is a this is a fairly good review of uh, what you might see on the test. Okay, I uh, I recommend you take a look at some of the videos again, especially the one we did uh, yesterday and the day before. Well, not yesterday, our last video and the one prior to that one. And obviously, take a look at this video again. Take some notes. You know, anything you don't understand. Do not hesitate to contact me. Okay, shoot me an email, send me a message, give me a call. Uh, you have my my contact information. Okay. And uh, so we'll leave it at that. Okay. And uh, take a look at this video. Okay, like I said, take notes. Take a look. Take a look at the last two videos, and uh, that should give you a good idea of what, what the test should look like okay and so I'm gonna stop this video now and let you guys continue with this bye bye